Well, Oxbridge University is a, uh, everybody knows it. many people from the establishment will, will have passed through here and our decision makers, our future decision makers, you may be, uh, well, you may well be amongst them. And I believe that at a point where you're studying and your minds are open to all sorts of ideas and visions and experiences, uh, maybe on the road to closure, once, if you get towards establishment, because uh, one of the things that I've found and discovered is that it requires a, an, an immense amount of courage to be able to speak against the, the, the flow. Um, and we are often, especially talking about the world here, we're talking about, or at least what I'm talking about, it is foreign policy, how that's led to radicalization, if that's what you want to call it. The security threat for people within the Muslim community is, is spoken about very often. And there really isn't a, a proper engagement and a proper understanding with the community, with the section of the community that, is, that, is, that needs to be spoken to. Now, my, my example I'll give you is the IRA. But for decades, there was a, a war that was taking place between Britain and the Irish Republican Army. And to bring that to an end, what was required was the most unpalatable thing. To speak to those people who were in charge of the IRA. Those people who were the political representatives of the IRA, the Sinn Féin. At that time, it was uh, you couldn't even have Jerry Adams' voice. Uh, broadcast on the television it had to be um, dubbed by an actor. But to get to a position of um, dialogue and understanding, there had to be a compromise in the position of the government. And that was, do we speak to terrorists? And is it conducive to a, to a peaceful future to even start using that term? Uh, and so you'll find if you go to Northern Ireland that people try to avoid the use of that term from the very communities who want a peaceful solution. And uh, it's so, sorry for to going around for, for a long-winded answer, but these are precisely the sorts of things I think that people here who may become part of the establishment at some point need to remember and remind themselves that peaceful solutions to very difficult problems require courage and sometimes doing or speaking to people that they require are regarded as the most unpalatable. Uh, no you can't. Uh, there was a case that myself and several other former Guantanamo prisoners had against the government. It was a civil action. Uh, for complicity of torture. Uh, at the end of 2010 we came to an agreement and that was because the government had fought and expended I think approximately 30 to 40 million pounds into that case. They had used 60 defence barristers. Um, several of us in that case were not entitled to legal aid, including myself, so there was a limit to how far we could fight, how much money we could pump in to this case. Um, the ultimate goal was, was for us to seek uh, an apology from the government, but that's not what you get through litigation. Uh, generally, you'll get compensation. Uh, and so, in the end of that process, we came to a position where the government was forced to turn over documents that showed clearly they, they knew they were involved in uh, and were complicit in our torture. And that's what brought them to a negotiating table. We weren't in a position of strength in that we were able to argue for more than what they were offering and what we were essentially asking for is complete exoneration. At that point the Prime Minister and the people negotiating with us said that they will uh, order a, a, a judge-led inquiry into our torture uh, and that the financial settlement would not be, as far as they're concern, concerned, an acceptance of liability, but in de facto terms it is. Um, and so that was a part of what was taking place and simultaneously the police mounted a criminal investigation 
of the intelligence services. So we sat down uh, as the former prisoners and gave hours and hours of testimony to the police about the actions of the intelligence services. Um, well, without going into details of any particular organisation, the uh, the right under international law, under any basic common law, is to uh, be able to resist foreign occupation of any, any foreign occupier. And I think that's as true for a country that occupies a place for two days, two years, or twenty years. Um, so, my wife, she's Palestinian. And she was, or well, her family were thrown out of their homes in, in 48 when Israel was created. They still are owned, or still hold the documents of their land, of their home, that they were thrown out of. Uh, in the hope that one day that they could return. The reality on the ground, of course, is that their homes, their land has been seized. So what, why don't they have a right to return home? And in terms of... Um, resisting that occupation, however it is. I don't believe it's right uh, for any group, organization, or individuals to target um, civilians, uh, non-combatants. Uh, but the nature of modern warfare is that that's exactly what's been going on. Um, gosh, I don't know. Uh, it, at the time, when I was evacuating, I was living in Afghanistan, I was helping to run a school. So I'd probably have been a teacher in some third world country, I think. Uh, that's why I think I, I would have been doing. But uh, who, know, who knows? I mean, it's not, I'm unable to answer that question. <laughs> All I know is what has happened yeah. and, and the trajectory that's taken brought me to here at this point.